Hi, my name is Rick Edgman, and as you can see, I'm professor and chair of the management department of Forte State University in the United States. I hold additional appointments in the Shingo Institute at Utah State University, in the Department of Business and Technology at Aarhus University in Denmark, and also in the Department of Technology and Innovation at the University of Southern Denmark in Odense. This particular slide set is going to be dealing with modern slavery, and in particular, we'll look at certain supply chains within the context of modern slavery. We'll also look at some issues that are related, such as poverty and so on. Now, today there are up to 46 million slaves in the world today. At no time in human history have there been more slaves in the world than today. No nation is immune, though its form will differ greatly from nation to nation. Many of us, at least in the United States, recognize this statement, but it's part of a larger context. Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry was an American patriot, and he said this as part of leading up to the American Revolutionary War against the British in the 1700s. But few of us know the context in which that statement was made. He went on to say, Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. So the basic content of this presentation day, again, is going to be looking at slavery, but there are different things that are there. So what is your slavery footprint? We're not going to talk about it very much, but I provide a link for you where you can determine at least approximately what your slavery footprint is. That is, how many slaves are your activities essentially uh, leading to their predicament just based on your activity, things like travel and uh, the amount of electronics that you use, the clothes you own, the food you eat, and so on. What is your slavery footprint? Beneath the mass, benefiting from slavery. Virtually all of us benefit from slavery, even though we don't necessarily know it, we're not aware of it. Poverty is, e is slavery's economic twin. We'll look at peace and danger. Slavery is a business, because it is a business. Child labor, um, as a case study. We'll look at chocolate and coffee. We will look oh, excuse me, we will look at luxury holidays, for example, in Dubai, Thailand and the seafood supply chain, Africa and the Congo, and what's happening in uh, both the Congo and Africa more broadly, sex trafficking supply chain, what old business looks like, what new expectations are, and what is it that you can do? What are some of the actions that you can take if in fact you would like to be part of the solution and not part of the problem? So let's look at a mini case study in some sense, which is just the idea of what is your slavery footprint. And again, you contribute to a slavery footprint through your use of electronics, through cell phones. Most of us uh, have a cell phone or a mobile phone and some of the materials that are used in that. Uh, most of us like chocolate or coffee or tea. Those things also use, oftentimes come from uh, slave production. So what is it that is your slavery footprint? If you go to this particular website that is listed at the bottom of the slide, you'll be able to work through that yourself, again, at least approximately. Now, in American history, there are a couple dates that uh, will come up, and we'll talk about that. And by the way, you saw that number 65 up here. That number 65 is my approximate slavery footprint. Far too high. I need to work on it. I need to say, what is it that I can cut out of my life? What can I do differently that would reduce that number to something far smaller? I would, I would say that with some shame, I saw the magnitude of that number. These are two important dates. 22nd of September, 1862. Again, these are more relevant for people who live in the United States. That was when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation freeing the slaves in the southern states. It didn't go into effect until the 1st of, of January, 1863. Juneteenth, 19th of June, 1865, that's when slave, slaves were freed in Texas. But whoever you are, like me, you benefit from slavery. You benefit uh, from slavery via your use of electronics, the clothes you wear, 
uh, or other items such as towels and, and rugs and so on, carpentry, fishing, cocoa, timber, so many things. And you can see some of the supply chains, at least as they impact the United States. So the top five imported products at risk of modern slavery in the U.S. are exactly those, electronics, garments, fish, cocoa, timber. And you can see how those make their way into the U.S. by virtue of the various colored lines that you see on this graph. So slavery in agriculture and aquaculture are huge. From sugarcane and cattle from Brazil, South Sudan and Niger, coffee and cocoa from the Ivory Coast, from Colombia, from Nigeria, nuts from Peru and Bolivia, corn from Bolivia. Those are just examples. That's in what we use, what you drink, it's in what you eat, it's in what you wear. Sunflowers from Myanmar, prawns from, from uh, Thailand and Myanmar, fish from Ghana, Indonesia and Thailand, palm oil from Malaysia, sesame and beans from Myanmar, so many things. As a mini case study, consider poverty, which I consider to be slavery's economic twin. And the reason is that it's poverty that oftentimes forces people into slavery or that motivates the, uh, the taking of slaves. So in terms of poverty, look at the base of the pyramid, the base of the pyramid of the have-nots. That is the 71% of the world's population that holds only 3% of the world's wealth. Generally speaking, the base of the pyramid is defined as those people living on under two United States dollars per day. Some people would use the figure at $1.90 per day. The wealth of those people who live at the base of the pyramid, approximately three and a half to four billion people in this world is matched by the wealth of the eight wealthiest people in the world. Eight compared to four billion. One person for every half billion at the base of the pyramid as an average. What about the top of the pyramid, the people who, who are the haves? Those are ones who have, as might be called, ultra wealth. So we can see what that population is, the number of individuals, and we can see the total wealth that they hold. And this is just uh, looking at approximately the top three and a half percent of people in the world. And this is from about 2015. Poverty, extreme poverty in America. Let's look at that. Read the United Nations Special Monitors Report. And you can see the website, and I will provide the website for a number of resources as we go through this particular presentation. People living in extreme poverty in the United States, that is on less than $1.90 per day, you can see that in the U.S. that it is virtually zero. But we do have, well, excuse me, let me go backwards. You can see that in Canada, half of 1% live in truly extreme poverty. Okay. So this is the U.S., U.S. and Canada. And the picture in the U.S. and Canada is a far better picture than it is across most of the world. So this is the global map. And you can see how desperately poor it is in many places in Africa and certain other parts of the world, and certain parts of South and Central America, for example. You can tell that by looking at the legend that resides in the lower left-hand corner of this particular graph. You can see that in the Russian Federation, they say that no one lives in that extreme poverty. Perhaps that's true, perhaps that isn't quite so true. But you can see in much of Southeast Asia, and much of Central Asia, in so much of the southern part of Africa, in parts of the Middle East, that you have extreme poverty. Look at the darkest color that you see, the darkest, deepest red that you see. And you see some nations where more than 75% of that nation's population 
live on $1.90 per day, or it might be said that they die slowly on less than $1.90 per day, or that they live miserably on less than $1.90 per day. The picture is not quite as bad in South and Central America, but nevertheless you can see that it, uh, the South and Central America have certain places where poverty is rampant. For example, in Bolivia, 7.1% of the people live on $1.90 per day or less. In Honduras, 16% of the people. In Haiti, 23.5% of the people. In Suriname, 23.4% of the people. Venezuela, 10.2%. Guyana, 14%. So there are pockets of extreme poverty throughout the world. Now look more carefully at Africa, because Africa is truly an extreme case. You can see the Democratic Republic of the Congo, 77.1%. Madagascar, 77.6%. Nigeria, 53.5% and various other nations with high percentages of their populace that live on $1.90 per day or less. Somalia, in Somalia you don't necessarily see a figure, it's, the figure is not available. However, what can be said is part of the threat in Somalia is because of the activity of Somali pirates. So that might be just a, a trivia fact that's interesting to you, but not so interesting if you live there. So let's look at a, a mini case study on peace and danger. Peace and danger, what about peace or the perception thereof? Seven of the ten most peaceful countries in the world are European nations, at least by virtue of perception. Look at you that figure, that large circle on the graph. U.S. $9.8 trillion is the impact of violence, the negative impact of violence to the global economy. It's equivalent to the combined uh, gross domestic products of Italy, the United Kingdom, France, and Germany. And you can see some of the other data points that are on the graph. When you look at this particular map, you can see where various nations, or, or which nations, are perceived as the greatest threat to peace in various parts of the world. You can see, for example, large parts of, of the United States flag dominating the global map. Even in Australia, the United States is perceived as the greatest threat to world peace. In the United States and in Canada, the flag that you see is the flag of Iran. So different uh, flags that pop up here and there in the Middle East, it's not too surprising that some nations regard Israel as the greatest threat. You can see that in Africa on the eastern coast, that Somalia is perceived as the biggest threat in some places. So notice that there are just a few nations that truly dominate the perception around the world of who it is that is most dangerous. The greatest threat to peace. Who does the world think is the greatest threat to peace? The United States. Danger from women. If you look at different places in the world, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somalia, and the Congo, and look at the legend, uh, for each of those you can see what issues it is that makes those places dangerous for women. So for example, in Afghanistan, you can see that it is, excuse me, threats to health, and I'm sorry that that keeps happening, uh, non-sexual violence, and also discrimination. And you can read the legend and see what it's like in other places. Distant danger is abstract for most of us, but local danger is real. So here are just a few places around the world, from Poland to Pakistan to the Philippines to Australia uh, to Saudi Arabia to the Ukraine, Italy, Venezuela, America with St. Louis, and so on. And you can see what the primary dangers are in those particular places. For example, in St. Louis, Missouri, 
which is not so very far from where I'm located, it is murder and riots that are the greatest, uh, the greatest dangers locally. In Perth, Australia, it's drugs. In Manila, the Philippines, it's murder, it's drugs, it's gangs. And you can see the, uh, the way that danger manifests locally in various places just from this particular map. Slavery is a business, make no mistake. So let's look at child labor as, some as one example of how slavery is a business. Around the world, about 165 million children are exploited. They work on farms, in mines, and as domestic servants. Slavery in the world is found in very ordinary things. Again, about 46 million slaves in the world today. It's more than any time in human history. But 58% of those slaves can be found in just five nations. By number, India is the largest, with about 18 million slaves in India. China, around 4 million. North Korea, 5% of its own population. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, forced labor in places like mines. Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan that turns out to be primarily agricultural labor forced by its government. Pakistan, so many forms of slavery, so different in different places, but five nations dominate, India, China, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and North Korea. Fashion, the fashion industry, is believed to be the second highest risk industry for modern slavery and technology. Brick making, seven days a week, 12 hours a day, with just a few brief breaks, 150 loads of 24 bricks each, almost 50,000 pounds, about uh, 22,000 kilograms per day that are carried on the backs of children, young women, teenagers, so many that are, are in that sort of effort. So in construction and brick making, in cocoa, and sex trafficking, the average age of sex trafficking victim in the United States is between 11 and 14 years of age in production and agriculture and fishing. Chocolate and coffee, far more than you expect. So for example, slavery in the chocolate industry, you see in brand name candy that most of you or many of you would recognize. So a reasonable question for you if you want to reduce your slavery footprint is how much chocolate do you consume? How much coffee do you drink? How much tea do I drink? I don't drink coffee, but I drink a lot of tea. How much do I do of those certain things? How much could I reduce that? Could I be more deliberate about where the chocolate that's used or where the coffee comes from, where those things are sourced? Of course I could. I could take it upon myself to become more knowledgeable about these things and to avoid certain brands or certain sources of various products, not just coffee and chocolate. What about a nice holiday? How many of you would love a nice holiday in a place like Dubai? I've been to Dubai many times. I served on an academic advisory board for a university in Dubai from 2002 through 2012. Visually, in many ways, it's a city of wonder. In many ways. Certainly, there are many enjoyable things to do for tourists. But like many places, Dubai has its own dark side, its own dark underbelly. Would you enjoy a luxury holiday someplace like that? Um, I would. In fact, I did. Twice. At that particular site. So what is it that we see in Dubai? Amazing things. The world's tallest building. The Burj Dubai. The Burj Al Arab, which looks like a giant uh, sail. Luxury hotel. 
up here, if you can see where my pointer is pointing, that is a uh, tennis court. We have a restaurant up here. So many things that are available. But here's the thing. Dubai, which is one of the seven emirates in the United Arab Emirates, 85% of the workers are migrant workers. They are 85% of approximately 5.3 million people. 90% are in the private sector. That is, they're working in construction, in hospitality, and in domestic service. Each one of those, those areas has its own primary demographic. For example, uh, construction, those are primarily workers from India. In hospitality or domestic service, oftentimes you're looking at those from the Philippines. If you're looking at the sex trade, it's primarily those from China. So a majority of these 85% of the 5.3 million population, which is oh, close to 4.5 million people, are from the rural areas of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines. But just 30 minutes away from all that splendor that you see are approximately 50,000 workers who are housed that are forced to live for years, oftentimes with their passports seized, forced to live for years without their families in labor camps. And if you've visited Dubai, you may often see those workers working in uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 degrees uh, Celsius, or higher temperatures, often in the heat of the day. And it gets much warmer than that in Dubai, often. Workers are lucky if there are only two people in an 8-foot by 10-foot room. So in about uh, a 2.5 meter by approximately 3 meter room to have two people that live and sleep in that room. They're fortunate if that's their condition. So for these people, many if not most of them, their lives consist of working, eating, sleeping, and doing it all over again. Day after day after day after month after year. What about seafood in Thailand? So you have so many workers, mostly males, who are sold to the sea, human trafficking in Thailand's fish industry. How much seafood do you eat? How much do you enjoy prawns? I love prawns. I have reduced my consumption once I became aware of this particular issue. But how Asian workers produce the prawns that are on plates in the United States? About 90% of the 650,000 workers in the Thai fishing industry are migrants. The U.S. buys 50% of all Thai exports. Thailand ships about 500,000 metric tons. 500,000 metric tons. Or about 550,000 U.S. tons. You have 1,700,000, more than that, registered migrant workers from Myanmar, from Cambodia, and from Laos that were in Thailand as of November 2017. So this is a, an incredibly large workforce overall, but 90% of those in the fishing industry itself from, are, in fact, migrants. So the Thai fishing industry is one of the world's biggest exporters of seafood. They use forced labor, a form of modern slavery. Most of the migrant workers are from neighboring countries. What does slavery in the supply chain look like? Uh, where does it most uh, crop up? Well, there are about seven different steps in the supply chain. First of all, you obviously have to harvest the food or to, uh, to man the ship. So you see uh, how it is that you do that, and the first step is harvest the fish. Slavery abounds. Modern slavery abounds in that step. Transport the fish, the shrimp, etc., process those. Slavery also involved. And then transport that to wholesalers, to retailers, and dinner on the plate. So it's in steps one and step three predominantly where you'll see slavery. The thing about it is 
once that food is processed, it is almost impossible to tell whether or not it's food that has come from engagement of modern day slaves or not. Let's look at Africa and the Congo. The Congo we'll look at as a special case, but we'll look at Africa more broadly first. So Africa really is the epicenter of modern slavery in the world today. It's probably about to become the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic sweeping the globe as of today. Today is 3rd of May, 2020, as I record this. Africa will be hard hit. It is estimated, by the way, that more than 200 million people in the world will be put at extreme food risk and starvation by the COVID-19 pandemic. As you might well guess, the majority of those are expected to come from Africa. This is a United Nations projection. So what about Africa? 9.2 million people in slavery in Africa in the late 2000s. If you want to look at the so-called Blood Diamonds, some of you may have seen a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio called Blood Diamond. Those mostly come from the area around Angola, the Ivory Coast, that particular area. You can see the areas as you examine this particular map. Human organ, organ trafficking, South Africa. Forced trial labor, Nigeria, the Sudan, Chad. Not that it isn't in other places, but it's common there. Sex and human trafficking, Nigeria, very common. Also out of the, the Congo and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which are indeed two separate nations. Conflict minerals. And that's where we will highlight the Congo. And then, of course, you can take a look at the map. And as you take a look at Nigeria, you will see Boko Haram and what they do, the true atrocities committed by Boko Haram. So let's look at the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the Congo itself. So there are two areas of the Congo. There is now what is called the Republic of the Congo, it used to be the French Congo, and the Belgian Congo, now called the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We will focus most of our attention, excuse me, on the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So this area um, is famous for things like blood diamonds. Not just blood diamonds, it's, it's a very mineral and materials rich area. That is part of the problem. And you may well know the story of the Belgian uh, domination of the Congo because of its riches. So many were killed, so many were put into slavery. It's a long time ago now, but the after effects lingo, linger, and there are their own manifestations today. So the Republic of the Congo, the one that we're not going to focus on so much, is the smaller of the, Cong of the two Congos. It's uh, got its own problems, certainly, but we're not going to focus our attention there. We will look at the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's Africa's second largest country by, by area that it covers, and it is incredibly rich in minerals. So according to the CIA, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a source, a destination, and possibly a transit country for men, women, and children subjected to forced labor and sex trafficking. The majority of, that, of this trafficking is internal. Internal. Congolese enslaving Congolese. And much of it is, is perpetrated by armed groups and rogue government forces outside of official control of the country's unstable eastern provinces. As an example, we will look at conflict minerals and materials. So first, what does the supply chain look like? The mine. Miners are working in hazardous conditions for very poor wages. Women and girls are abused, forced trial labor, 
operating under corrupt privatization deals and uh, land grabs and armed groups. The materials go to the trading house. From the trading house to exporters, from exporters to transit countries, from transit countries to refiners, from refiners to electronic companies. <coughs> and there are three particular materials that contribute greatly to this, especially three. Tin, tantalum, and tungsten. Okay, look in particular at the bottom one, tungsten. Look at the bottom one because the bottom one, tungsten, is what enables your cell phone to vibrate. Probably everyone watching this video has a mobile phone. There is a substantial possibility that the tungsten used in your cell phone and mine in fact came from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and has in fact been tungsten that has been gathered by slavery. So what does that supply chain look like in the Congo? The mine to the trading house to exporters to transit uh, countries to refiners to electronic companies to me and to you probably. What about sex trafficking? Sex trafficking is probably the one that most comes to mind when people think about modern slavery. It's been around for a very, very long time. There were Viking sex slaves. That is, quote unquote, the dirty secret behind the founding of Iceland. You'd probably find that article interesting. You can also find a really exceptional resource on sex trafficking, particularly of women, at the URL that is listed at the bottom of this particular slide. Sex trafficking is a booming industry. What is sex trafficking? It occurs when someone uses force, fraud, or coercion to cause an, a commercial sex act, that is exchange of money or exchange of property, with an adult or causes a minor to commit a commercial sex act. Commercial sex act, what is that? It includes prostitution, pornography, and sexual performance done in exchange for any item of value. Money, drugs, shelter, food, clothing, education, whatever it might be. It thrives because there truly is big demand. There's a buyer. The buyer is the one who fuels the market. If not for the buyers, there wouldn't be a market. So because of buyers, either there is direct perpetration with the victim or uh, through a trafficker or a pimp. Traffickers find victims how? Through social networking, and most of us know some of those stories because they're in the news fairly frequently. Home or neighborhood, in clubs or bars, on the internet, at school, and they attract them through promises of protection, love, adventure, home, opportunity. They may never fulfill those promises, but that is the lure on the fishing line for so many victims of sex trafficking. Traffickers use fear, violence, intimidation, and threats to get their way. The common age that a child enters sex trafficking is between 14 and 16, when they are often too young and naive, at first at least, to realize what's happening to them until it is too late, too young and too naive. So society might call it prostitution. Federal law calls it sex trafficking. And as it points out, we don't need to judge the victim. They need help, not our judgment, not punishment. But there's social stigma attached to this, or misinformation. And because of that, many times the victims of sex trafficking go on unidentified or they're misidentified. Uh, that is, because of being involved in sex trafficking, maybe they develop a drug problem. And so they're, uh, they're forced into treatment for drug problems, perhaps mistreated, misidentified and hence mistreated. So what happens? Sex trafficked children are instead treated for 
Oh, different things. Drug abuse, as we just mentioned, alcohol abuse, domestic violence, delinquency, teenage pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, abortion. <coughs> All of which mask the true need, and that is the need for freedom. So what is it you pursue with freedom? Prevention, restoration, and bringing judgment. So slavery is an old business, but there are new expectations, and those new expectations, fundamentally, are that there are tools available to help an organization spot the amount of slavery that is occurring within their own supply chain, within their own operations, to be able to identify, to report, and to extremely reduce or eradicate slavery in their operations and supply chain. So give a person a truth and that person will think for a day. Teach a person a reason and that person will think for a lifetime. So we've been giving you some truth in this presentation. The question now is, how are you going to reason about it? And what will you do with what you've learned? So the question is, what type of actions might be taken? First, it's very helpful to know the signs, or some of the common signs of modern slavery. They include physical appearance, and I won't read all of the text on this slide, but example would be physical appearance, somebody is anxious, they're nervous, they're depressed, they're paranoid, they appear withdrawn. They avoid help, they're reluctant to seek help, in fact. They avoid eye contact. They look malnourished or underfed. They show signs of, of physical and or sexual abuse physical restraint, confinement, or torture. Isolation. They rarely interact with other people. They're not allowed to travel by themselves. Always somebody with them. Not familiar with the neighborhood they live in or work in. They're not allowed to speak for themselves with a third party, always insisting on being present in their conversations to translate for them. And there are other elements. Poor living conditions, unusual travel times. They don't own anything or very little. So you might try this particular helpline if you're in the UK. On the other hand, here's, here's some alternative things, 12 indicators, use of deception, restricted movement, abuse of vulnerability, withholding of wages, excessive overtime that they're working, abusive working and living conditions, retention of ID documents such as passports, physical or sexual violence, debt bondage, intimidation and threats, fear and anxiety, limited family or social contact. So these are some of the various signs of modern slavery, not necessarily sex slavery, but of any kind of slavery. If you're in the U.S. and you really think that there is a situation that you have your eye on where modern slavery is involved, then this is a tip line that you can use. The phone number is 1-888-373-7888. Again, 1-888-373-7888. There are pathways out of slavery. Some involve our direct action. Some involve our reporting. Some involve changing of habits but also through governance and law, through education, through uh, development of economies, through health and relationships, through science and tech, so many routes that will contribute to helping people get out of modern slavery and to making this world a better world. But the real question becomes, what is it that you will do? What are you willing to do? Admittedly, it takes sharp eyes oftentimes to spot those, those signs from a couple of slides ago. But I would suggest, please, look at those slides again. You can obviously uh, go back in this particular recording. You can pause this recording. So many signs. And I would say, come to take your time. Learn those signs. And then keep your eyes open. Stay aware. And don't just automatically assign unreal reasons when in fact there's something true underneath there that may be modern slavery. 
Better to be safe than to be sorry. Better to over-report than under-report. Better to over-observe than under-observe. And this is a summary of Supply Chains, Modern Slavery, and You. Thank you.